I'm Claire Lobdell, one of the librarians at GCC, and this presentation, The Digital Traces of Pregnancy, Protecting Yourself in a post row World, is going to start with some scary dystopian stuff, which is not theoretical, it's already here, and then it's going to, in the second half of the presentation, talk about tools that you can use to protect yourself. The surveillance capabilities of private and state entities have expanded drastically since 1973 when Roe v. Wade became the law of the land. And so you need to know what those capabilities are if you want to protect yourself from them. I also hope to demonstrate in this presentation that while the people most at risk from restrictive abortion laws are people who are seeking abortions, that these laws endanger anyone who is pregnant or thinking of becoming so. Also a note on terminology, in this presentation, I'll use the term pregnant people. Pregnancy and abortion rights are not only a women's issue. There are plenty of trans men and non-binary folks out there who have ovaries and uteruses and who can and do get pregnant. I will use the term maternal mortality a few times in this presentation because that's the term used most frequently in the literature. Um, I'm going to include some screenshots of uh, headlines in newspapers and also some quotes from articles. And those, um, you know, a few of those do act as though women are the only people who get pregnant. Um, and I'm just including those because, you know, that's the text in the article. But when it's just me, I will use um, the term pregnant people. This is a graphic that appeared in the New York Times in 2021 showing where abortion access would decline if Roe versus Wade is overturned. All of the dots on the map are abortion clinics and the red dots are in states that have passed trigger laws in which um, abortion would be immediately illegal in those states if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade. Um, the color gradient shows where legal abortion um, is predicted to decline the most with the darkest spots being 40% um, uh, or larger decline in legal abortions. And we're currently seeing this play out in Texas where the Texas legislature and the governor signed into law SB 8, which um, deputizes citizen vigilantes to go out and sue people who help a pregnant person obtain an abortion. And these um, deputized vigilantes then get a $10,000 bounty for any of these cases that they successfully bring to court. There's plenty of evidence out there to show that um, people are more likely to survive their pregnancies in places where abortion laws are less restrictive. Um, so there was a big study that was done in 2019 of um, the laws and maternal mortality rates in 162 countries around the world. And they found that maternal mortality rates were 85 to 144 per 100,000 live births lower when abortion laws were relaxed in those countries. And there's probably several different reasons for this. So Almost certainly when abortion laws are relaxed, less restrictive, there are going to be fewer people dying of botched abortions. Also, pregnant people and their medical professionals are pretty good at knowing whether or not someone's health is going to be adversely affected or if they're likely to suffer serious injury or death if they do give birth. And in those cases, they are more likely to get a therapeutic abortion if um, the abortion laws are less stringent. And then finally, um, you know, pregnant people are more likely to trust their medical professionals if they don't have reason to fear that, you know, something they do during pregnancy could lead to them to be arrested. So restrictive abortion laws don't just lead to maternal mortality. 
They can also lead to higher infant mortality. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Missouri, which have passed restrictive abortion laws in recent years, including abortion bans, whether or not those bans have actually gone into effect. The states already have some of the highest infant mortality rates in the country. Um, and these rates are especially high for pregnant black people. And this is in part because these are some of the states that didn't expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. So they have many more people who are uninsured. And when people are uninsured, they're less likely to get prenatal care. Logic also suggests that pregnant people will be less trusting of medical professionals if they have reason to fear that seeking medical help could lead to arrest because of their actions during pregnancy. There are also places and cases in this country where pregnant people have been prosecuted for their actions during pregnancy. The article on the left is about a woman, Marche Jones, who um, got into a fight with another woman and uh, the other woman shot Marche in the abdomen. Uh, Marche was pregnant at the time and her fetus was hit by the bullet and died. Um, and Marche Jones was arrested for manslaughter, the manslaughter of the fetus, which uh, she did not shoot, which the person um, who she was fighting with shot. Um, she was arrested for manslaughter. A grand jury indicted her on that charge. Um, and while the charges were dropped a year later, she still had to go through all that. She was still jailed for um, that fight and, and for this charge of manslaughter. On the right, um, there uh, have been quite a few cases in Alabama and elsewhere, other states as well, um, where people have been arrested for um, even minute amounts of controlled sub substances that um, show up in their bloodstream during or after birth. So uh, <clears throat> that woman who is pictured in the picture on the right, her name is Casey Shelley. She was um, arrested for taking a single Valium a few weeks before she gave birth, and it didn't even show up in her infant's bloodstream after birth. Um, she was charged with knowingly, recklessly, or intentionally causing her baby to be exposed to controlled substances in the womb, a felony pu punishable in her case by up to 10 years of prison. So again, it's not just people who are seeking abortion who are put at risk by these laws. It can be very difficult for doctors and other medical professionals to distinguish between abortions and um, natural miscarriages when, say, a pregnant person comes into an emergency department and is, um, you know, bleeding heavily. Um, People in the U.S., El Salvador, and elsewhere have been prosecuted for miscarriages, um, especially in El Salvador. There have been cases where people have been in jail for years with um, what was almost certainly a miscarriage. Are purchases, app use, location, history, and more leave digital traces that data brokers and advertisers compile into detailed profiles of who we are and what we do. These digital traces that are used for one purpose, you know, created typically by private entities, private companies, can and are often subpoenaed and um, used by prosecutors and police departments to um, you know, prove criminal criminal activity. And that can be done just as easily in cases of um, suspected abortion as um, in any other type of prosecution. The most common places that we leave digital information about our plans and actions are in those communication tools that we use most often. So these are things like email, text, your browser history, so what websites you're looking at, things like Facebook Messenger or Facebook groups. And these, because they're the communication tools we use most often, are the places that prosecutors and police would use, would look at most frequently. And also the types of places where 
a uh, deputized vigilante, like in the case of Texas's SB8 law, would look for that information. But then there are other places that you leave digital traces of pregnancy, and we're going to go into that next. Many people use period tracking apps either because they want to track their cycle, because they want to get pregnant, because they specifically don't want to get pregnant. There was some investigative reporting that was done a few years ago that discovered that several of these period tracking apps that are commonly used are built on what's called Facebook Developer Kit, which is something that Facebook provides free to app developers. And what Facebook gets out of it is that the information that you put in the app is then shared back with Facebook and becomes part of the digital profile that they create about all their users and share with advertisers. Um, and in the case of at least one of these apps, it was sharing that information in plain text, including about when someone was ovulating, when people had had sex, um, if they included that information in their period tracking app. That's a lot of information to have about you. Um, and, you know, regardless of whether Facebook is the one getting the information, some of these apps um, sell information um, on their own to other advertisers. Again, if that information can be used one way, so commercially by advertisers, it can also be repurposed and used by law enforcement. Returning again to Facebook, Facebook collects a huge amount of data about users and licenses that to advertisers. This is a screenshot of an advertisement that the encrypted messenger company Signal tried to run on Facebook. And um, it shows uh, in those like highlighted dark blue parts the type of information that Facebook is sharing with advertisers. So this would be really targeted ads that would show up in someone's um, Facebook feed. Like, you got this ad because you're a K-pop loving chemical engineer. This ad used your location to see you're in Berlin and you have a new baby and you just moved and you're really feeling those pregnancy exercises lately. Now, Facebook claims that this whole thing was a stunt and a hoax, whereas Signal claims that they tried to run the ads and Facebook rejected them. So, you know, you can take that information as you will, but Facebook really collects a ton of information about people and not just the information that you volunteer through your posts, but also through the way that um, Facebook cookies track you as you're using other sites on the internet to make purchases, to browse, anything else. Stores, credit card companies, and um, customer loyalty programs, things like say your CVS card, also track a huge amount of information about you and your purchases and have been doing that for a really long time. So this, uh, these are some quotes from an article that came out in 2012. They're kind of long quotes, but I'm going to just read them because um, I think they're they really highlight the type of ways that companies keep and process our information. So in this article, it said, Target assigns each shopper a unique code known internally as the guest ID number that keeps tabs on everything they buy. If you use a credit card or a coupon or fill out a survey or mail in a refund or call the customer helpline or open an email we've sent you or visit our website, we'll record it and link it to your guest ID, Pohl said. Pohl is someone that worked there. We want to know everything we can. Also linked to your guest ID is demographic information like your age, whether you're married and have kids, which part of town you live in, how long it takes you to drive to the store, your estimated salary, whether you've moved recently, what credit cards you carry in your wallet, and what websites you visit. As Pohl's computers crawled through the data, he was able to identify about 25 products that, when analyzed together, allowed him to assign each shopper a pregnancy prediction score. More importantly, he could also estimate her due date to within a small window so Target could send coupons timed to very specific stages of her pregnancy. So part of the reason they did this, as they explain, is so they could send timed coupons. And the other reason is because um, Target is, you know, big into baby registries, and they know that once they hook someone, 
um, as a customer that uses a baby registry, they're likely to be a loyal customer for a long time. Most of us are carrying smartphones around with us all the time. And part of the reason that smartphones are so effective at um, most of the things we want them to do are because they are basically little GPS units that can hone in very carefully, very precisely to where you are so that you, know, you can use maps that point out where the things you're interested are located. And even if you have GPS location services turned off, your cell phone is still able to say where you are because it's constantly pinging um, nearby cell towers. Um, and that information can be looked up either at the time or um, historically. When someone, either you know, law enforcement or an advertiser, targets phones within a particular geographic location, that's called geofencing. And it's something that is used by law enforcement, um, but it's also been used by advertisers. So location-based geofencing can be used to find and target people at abortion clinics. There was a Boston advertiser that did that a few years ago. Um, they, they set up a geofence around some abortion clinics in Boston and then um, anti-choice groups sent information or propaganda to the cell phones of people who were in the clinic. Um, I think you can also imagine a scenario in which, say, police set up a geofence around a, you know, a suspected clinic location if um, Roe v. Wade is overturned or, you know, in, if there's a suspected location in Texas. Um, and location data has been used in all sorts of different ways that people were not expecting. Um, it came out, uh, I think about a year ago, maybe 2019, 2020, that um, the US military was buying the location data from various apps, including some Muslim dating apps where the users had absolutely no idea that their location data was being used in any way except to um, identify other people nearby that they would potentially be interested in dating. Many homes also have smart speakers, things like Alexa or Google Home or Apple HomePods. These are um, recording a lot of the time even when people don't realize they're recording. Um, there's been some reporting over the last few years that has found that, for example, Amazon workers were able to access Alexa owners' home addresses. Uh, no, I just, um, they were um, listening kind of in on conversations to try to um, improve the um, AI that recognizes speech. Um, and these smart speaker recordings are increasingly being um, subpoenaed by law enforcement for various um, criminal investigations. I think we've probably all heard about cases in which they Serial killers or their victims have been identified using DNA databases, both law enforcement DNA databases and consumer ones, um, where, say, a family member had submitted a DNA test to 23andMe or something like Ancestry DNA, and then tracing through that, um, investigators were able to identify someone else. This headline was published in October 2018, and at that time, they said that approximately 60% of white Americans could be ID'd through gene genealogy databases. Um, and at that time, they estimated that the proportion of that was estimated to go up to 90% within two to three years. And I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to identify serial killers. Um, you know, it's very hard to object to that. That's something we can all, or almost all, um, you know, sympathize with that. These databases have been used since, though, to um, identify people in much more, um, much looser ways. I mean, um, custody cases or other things that, you know, don't necessarily rise to the level of, um, of a 
you know, serial killer and their victims. Related to that last slide, we know of at least one instance where DNA has been used to try to identify fetal remains. So there was an instance in um, Georgia where um, people in a sewage treatment plant found um, fetal remains in wastewater. And there was no evidence that um, the fetus had ever breathed. Um, but the caption to the, um, the image read, neither the fetus nor the two people with whom its DNA might match has committed a crime. Um, so I think it's important to realize that, you know, if this, if this technology has been used at least once in the past, it is likely to be used again in the future. We're gonna walk through how to do a risk assessment, something also called threat modeling. This is an idea that comes from information security and it's way, a way of thinking about the security needs of different systems or different people and recognizes that different people have different needs and different levels of risk. So. You ask, what do I have that I want to protect? Or this is also, what are my assets? Number two, who do I want to protect it from? In other words, who are my adversaries? Number three, how likely is it that I will need to protect these assets? Number four, how bad are the consequences if I fail? And number five, how much trouble am I willing to go through to protect myself from potential consequences? Let's look more closely at that first question. What do I have that I want to protect or what are my assets? Mm -hmm. So these could be things like your communications, email, text, contacts, so people who might be helping you, especially in the case of Texas law, SB8, those people who are helping you could um, themselves be sued. Things like your location, your social media accounts, and then also things related to your own body, your physical safety, the freedom to make your own medical decisions, those are assets. Now we're going to get into that second question. Who are your adversaries, the people that you need to protect your assets from? These can be people or institutions like law enforcement, data brokers, which is um, any company that tracks and stores information about you, potentially family members or intimate partners, um, Intimate partners can use pregnancy as a way to trap a person into an abusive relationship or um, in the case of something like Texas Law SB8, the people who could um, sue those people who could help you obtain an abortion. So how likely are you to need to protect your assets from adversaries? That's going to depend on the local laws in your area whether or not you can trust the people around you, your well, yeah. family, your friends, your acquaintances, and honestly, how wealthy you are. We know from pre-Roe versus Wade times that wealthy people and white people were more likely to be able to obtain a safe abortion or any abortion at all. How bad are the consequences if you fail to protect your assets? Again, this is going to vary person to person. It could include being trapped in an abusive relationship, um, the risk of your physical or mental health, arrest and or incarceration for you and those who help you, um, potentially um, the loss of custody of other children if you have them. Now we're going to get into talking about very specific things you can do to protect yourself and the integrity of your personal information. This first slide is going to be some low tech steps and then we're going to get into some higher tech steps in the next one. So probably the very most important thing you can do is narrow your circle of trust. So can you trust the people you live with? Can you trust your family? These are really important questions to ask when you are figuring out who you can talk to about your reproductive plans. The next thing is to pay cash for anything pregnancy related. Don't use credit cards, don't use customer loyalty cards like your CVS card. Those are things that can track who you are, what you're buying. I would turn off my location tracking and also if you are going to a location to get an abortion, don't bring your phone to that 
clinic. Um, you know, we talked about geofencing earlier. There are also things that law enforcement uses called stingrays or MC catchers that um, intercept the cell signals from phones. Um, you can park away from clinic locations and walk to them. Many newer cars have built-in GPS units, and so, um, you know, those can be subpoenaed and um, law enforcement can tell where you've driven. And then finally, don't talk about anything sensitive in a room with a smart speaker. The people who you live with could access it, um, and like we talked about before, it can be um, subpoenaed, the records from a um, smart speaker can be subpoenaed. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some higher tech steps that you can take to protect yourself. The first one is to use something called the Tor browser when searching for information about your reproductive choices online. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a minute. The second is um, don't reuse your password. So use the same password for multiple accounts or link your account accounts. So sometimes you'll see something that says, you know, log in using your Google credentials or log in using your Facebook credentials, like link these accounts. Um, the reason that's not a great idea is for one, if someone figures out your password to one account, then they can get into others. Also, when you link accounts, it means that not only can someone get into a bunch of things if they figure out your password, but also um, you, all those accounts are then sharing information with Google, Facebook, or whichever other one you choose. And then enable two-factor authentication. So that's when you um, need a secondary piece of information to log into account uh, into an account. A lot of times, that's uh, you know a text that you get with a numeric code. The next thing is to use encrypted texting and ideally encrypted texting with expiring messages to discuss anything sensitive. And again, I'll talk a little more about what that means in just a second. And then finally, turn off biometric authentication on your phone. So biometric authentication means using something about your body, whether it's um, your face print or a fingerprint to unlock your phone. Those things can be especially dangerous if you have reason to fear the people that you live with. Um, it's not unheard of for someone to pick up um, their partner's phone when the partner is sleeping and, you know, press the finger to the phone to unlock it. Um, there have been many instances where family members with similar faces are able to unlock each other's phones. TOR is an acronym that stands for the Onion Router, and it is a browser that you can install on your computer that um, connects you to a relay of different computers across the internet, and it makes it so that your ISP, your internet service provider, so whatever company you use to connect you to the internet, whether it's something like Comcast or Verizon, your ISP doesn't know what websites you're accessing and thus can't keep a record of you. And the websites that you're accessing, um, unless you sign into them or otherwise enf enter info into them, don't know who you are. Um, and the Tor browser doesn't save any information uh, um, about those websites that you visit, unlike something like Google Chrome. There are also a bunch of fake Tor browsers out there, so make sure that if you're using this, you download it from torproject.org. Because our phones are um, basically tracking devices in our pockets because of the GPS that is installed on them, it's a little bit more complicated to um, uh, anonymize the websites that you're looking at in the same way that you can when you're using a physical computer. But there are a couple of apps that you can use um, that are endorsed by Tor that basically do a similar thing. Um, so uh, for um, Android, you need two apps for this. You need one called Orbot that is something called a proxy server. That's um, what you, uh, what kind of 
bounces you to the external sites and then you need something called orfox that's the browser um, and you need to have orbot the proxy enabled first in order for orbot the browser to be anonymous for Apple phones, the legit um, Tor style browser that's endorsed by Tor is something called Onion Browser. So if you're looking for it in the Apple Store, make sure that you're getting the one called Onion Browser um, because there are a bunch of knockoffs also available in the store. If you want to know whether or not any of your passwords have been compromised, it's a good idea to go to this website, haveibeenpwned.com, P-W-N-E-D. Type in your email address and it will let you see whether or not your email address and um, the passwords linked to it have been compromised in any data breaches. Um, now this won't I, it let you know if, say, you know, a friend or family member or partner has figured out your password, but it is a good idea if you see that um, your password for a particular account has been compromised in a data breach to then go in, change that password on that site and any other pass any other sites where you're using the same password. What makes for a strong password? Well, strong passwords are long random and unique, but our brains aren't really wired terribly well for remembering long, random, unique strings of characters. And so um, a good way to get around that um, is to use strings of words that aren't necessarily connected with each other in the real world, you know, that they aren't phrases from a book or lyrics from a song that could be predicted once you know the first few, um, but are unrelated words. If you go to the um, Electronic Frontier Foundation or do a web search for Electronic Frontier Foundation and something called Diceware, it's a strategy for coming up with um, one of these strong passwords with um, random words. And then what you can do once you've created that big strong master password is use it with something called a password manager. So you use this master passcode to get into your password manager and then save all your other passwords in the password manager. The password manager can generate and save other um, long random unique passwords. I also mentioned encrypted messaging as one of those um, higher tech ways that you can protect your information. The one I really like is called Signal Encrypted Messenger. You can get this in the Apple and Android stores. Um, to text with someone using this, the person on the other end needs to also have Signal installed on their um, device. But um, when something's encrypted, it uh, it's basically scrambled up and unreadable when it's traveling through the air. Um, and you can set up your individual um, contacts in um, within Signal um, so that your messages with that person disappear after a specified amount of time. So you go into the contact um, and you select disappearing messages and then you you know specify the length of time they can see them. So you know whether it's a day or a few hours or after they read it. Finally, there are people out there who are committed to help um, pregnant folks access safe abortion services, even in places where abortion is not legal. There is the um, abortion travel funds, um, Plan C pills, which is sponsored by the National Women's Health Organization. It's a place to get abortion pills online. There's an organization called the Digital Defense Fund that provides digital security for the abortion access movement. And um, there's an NGO called Women on Waves that provides safe abortion services in international waters. So these are just a few organizations that can help people.